Oh, good. Yeah. All right. And we're, we're recording. We're on the air. Oh, great to see you again, Peter. It's been yeah. since 2012, late 2012, since wow. uh, we met at a, a SENS conference. Exactly. Uh, right. Yeah. So, how have you been? Very good. You're very good. Yeah. Just making our making our eye go a lot smarter. The, I mean, that's what I've been doing basically for the last five plus years is just in stealth mode, making eye go mm -hmm. smarter. And we are actually mm -hmm. now flat out in money raising mode to commercialize our second generation of the technology because mm -hmm. I sold my interest in the original commercial company and, you know, where we commercialized it in the call center. But it turned out the call center space was still kind of too narrow, you know, too sort of narrow AI rather than AGI. -ish. So that's why I decided five years ago to uh, hand over management. I hired a CEO and uh, handed over management of the, of the commercial company and started basically the new company, iGo.ai. And we've been busy with um, 10, 12 people for the last five years, just improving the technology. And we're now ready to give a personal personal assistant to 7 billion people. That's the Wow, plan. that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, these personal assistants are gaining traction these days. I spoke to Thomas Dietrich at AGI like 11 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I did an interview with him about personal assistants. He's one of the uh, sort of founders of the idea really. Uh, that was really interesting. But we're going to be talking about understanding in... Um, like AGI or mm -hmm. machine comprehension. Right. Now, it may be something that's been sort of overlooked or many of the traditional AI people might think it's not that important or that it's in such an elusive term that it's a distraction. What are your thoughts on understanding and machines, machine understanding? Mm. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, as you know, I've, I've written an article on, on that to sort of explain. Yeah, case word. Yeah, ex explain my ideas. But uh, I think it is a very important term. And uh, one of the sort of um, themes that I see is that a lot of people in AI are really don't, aren't comfortable in understanding artificial intelligence from a cognitive perspective, you know, sort of cognitive psychology and philosophy, epistemology from that realm. Uh, you know, a lot of good uh, engineers. Um, software engineers are mathematicians, logicians, and that's kind of the only way they can look at it. And then they, you know, talk about prediction and compression and stuff like that. And mm. I think that's missing really a very, very important element and bringing this, connecting us to the real world, you know, to things like common sense, you know, which you also, uh, I think, want to, want to talk about. So I think, uh, you know, like consciousness, awareness, uh, you know, thought and and um, and understanding. I think these are all important terms to to really get your get your head around what cognition requires. And I think you need to understand cognition in order to really build uh, AGI. Mm -hmm. All right. So so um, how would you then like uh, define understanding? Is it foundationally? Um, is it something foundational to cognition or is it something that might emerge from it? Well, f first of all, any, any term, any concept that we have, uh, you know, doesn't have a mathematical, uh, I mean, not any, there are obviously mathematical terms that have mathematical definitions, but basically in, in common language, uh, the way we use terms uh, is much, much more fuzzy. So they don't have a, a crisp, clear definition. You get, you know, sort of a, a range of, you describe it basically and uh, and and that's where uh, understanding comes in you know and basically you use it and and I, and I think it's very important to bring it back to sort of everyday use and you know you're in a foreign country and you say somebody doesn't understand you and that's one kind of understanding you know or uh, another thing might be um, that that you say well somebody doesn't understand it because they don't have the subject knowledge um, you know, and then there might be another level at which you say somebody doesn't understand or does understand something because they understand the, the full implications of what you're saying. Um, you know, sort of Trump got elected, you know, so 
Mm. Do you understand it at the language level, what that means? You know, if you're speaking in a foreign language, you might not know what that means. Uh, do you understand what the actual meaning of that is? He got elected to, you know, president of the United States. Okay, I understand that. And then you sort of say, well, do you understand the full implications? I mean, I don't know why I thought of that example in particular, but, um, you know, clearly there are, there are implications to, to that, you know. And, uh, so there are levels of understanding, basically. That's, that's a sort of first important uh, part to, to really grasp. Um, and, um, you know, an AI needs to ultimately be able to handle all of those. So if you, if you say, you know, blah, 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 Uber, and, um, and Siri gets Uber, then you can say, ah, oh, Siri understood me, you know. But that's very, very shallow understanding where somebody just was response is sort of you know what seems to be understanding because if you say i hate uber like a chatbot yeah if you say i hate uber and siri gives you the uber app then um you know you can see there really wasn't understanding you know that's sort of pattern matching but there wasn't actually any in any meaningful way deep understanding or any depth of understanding so you have grades of understanding depth of understanding uh, that can go all the way to theory of mind of the full implications in the, you know how it plays out and how something would play out in the world you know mm -hmm. so for instance like um if there was like some like a i guess attacks or, or assaults in in a state park um and uh people noticed that the the assaults went up um at the same time as ice cream sales going up Mm -hmm. And therefore, people assumed that the reason why the assaults were happening was because of the ice cream. Mm -hmm. And they thought, well, there's a simple solution. Let's just get rid of the ice creams and mm -hmm. surely the assaults will disappear. Um, that's, that's, that arguably isn't understanding some causal relationship that's going on um, that isn't being picked up by that sort of, you know, yes, those two of, stats. of course. Yeah, of course, exactly. I mean, understanding, there are just many, many different things you understand and what you pointed out now is causal relationships is, is one of them. Um, you know, that's basically, and I mean, there's theory of mind. What was the other person thinking or what was the other person's motivation? Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, there are many different dimensions of, of understanding. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, th what about psych? It used to like people um, in the early days of AI, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was psych, and they, they used to say that, well, once it reaches like a um, 2,000 axioms, then we'll start to begin to understand things. When it did reach 2,000 axioms or something like that, or 1,000, then, yeah. then it doubled. No, 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 okay. Um, it's not understanding anything. Maybe it's 4,000, um, or maybe not 4,000. 8,000, you know, yep. <laughs> 16,000. Right. Well, I mean, that's why... They I'm, never got there. Right. I mean, that's why I get back to, to um, saying it's... Uh, it's on a scale, it's, you know, they're, they're different aspects of it. I mean, the, the simplest one is basically, do you respond correctly? You know, you could have, you could be in another country and you hear something that you have no understanding what they're saying, but whenever somebody says it, uh, I don't know, they, they pass the salt, salt or open the door or something, you know, so uh, you don't know what the words are. It might be, a, um, it, it, it might be some, in the very indirect way of, 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 of saying it, you know. Uh, I mean, if somebody says hungry, uh, says I'm hungry, and somebody, you know, and you see this a, f a few times, and somebody passes you bread, then you might think what they're saying is pass me the bread, but actually what they're saying is I'm hungry, you know. Um, so that's, that's a very uh, shallow understanding, and that's sort of the level at which the, 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 the chatbots are, that they may be, may be able to respond correctly to the command, but uh, it's, it's a bit of a stretch calling that understanding. Yeah, well, they call it natural language understanding, but it's, maybe they're using the term very loosely there because... Right, right. And, and, yeah, and, I find, very good right? and I find that very annoying because they've basically destroyed another term, you know, like IBM destroyed the term cognitive computing. There's <laughs> you know, nothing cognitive about what, what they do. And, and yeah, they've basically destroyed that term. So yeah, natural language understanding, uh, where it's really uh, looking for keywords in a, in a sentence, you know, is, uh, is, is really an abuse of, of the term understanding. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, it it, it becomes very difficult uh, when once the machines then um, try and do follow up. Like if someone asks a follow up question, then it's really hard for them to know how to respond unless there's already a decision tree um, that's been programmed into it by you know um, chat script or whatnot. You know, uh, yeah. and, and if, if they don't already have a pre prepared follow up, then they're lost. Or well, they, they just take a term from the sentence and look it up in Wikipedia and repeat the Wikipedia. Well, 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 right. And, and uh, the, the thing is, you can't just look at the performance of the system by itself in a few mm. tests and sort of really judge is there, what level of understanding is there. You really need to look under the covers and see how it's doing that. So, mm. you know, for example, uh, yes. in, in our architecture, when, um, you, when it reads an article, um, it absorbs that article and, that, and integrates that knowledge into its existing knowledge base. And uh, if you then ask a question, the, the question is answered from that integrated knowledge. It doesn't refer to the original thing, so it can't, uh, you know, it, it can't just pick phrases or, or, or sentences from the original input space. And, but which also means you can ask questions in a, in a much wider and, and much more flexible way. So I, th I think that's an important aspect of, of understanding is taking uh, a, a sentence and integrating it into your existing knowledge and making the connections. Mm, interesting. So, I mean, let's talk about the Turing test and how that sort of isn't good enough really to to sort of predict machine um, understanding. And I mean, it does. It's a very limited sort of a uh, right. um, scope yeah. there. Yeah, know, I, I actually, I actually also have an article on that in, in, in Medium.com. Uh -huh. And the way the way I explain it is, um, the Turing test asked too much and too little at the same time. And what I mean by that is. It asks too much in, in that it expects you not only to have all, all human knowledge and, and reasoning, but in addition to that, to fake being a human and, you know, fake human emotions, human experience, basically, you know, what was your childhood like and, and all of that. So it asks way too much of, uh, um, of it in that, in that sense. I mean, it's just not re reasonable for a system that didn't grow up it didn't you know didn't have a childhood uh, it doesn't have inherent built in emotions to uh, you, to expect a system like that to tell you about its experiences and its emotions um, but it asks too little in the sense that you really just have to be good at fooling the judges and we saw that a few years ago where you know supposedly the Turing test was passed because somebody like just yeah. yeah because somebody just pushed the buttons, uh, the, 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 the judges' buttons, and said, hey, I'm just a little kid from wherever, you know, Eastern Ukraine. Europe or some, Ukraine or something, and I don't really understand English that well, and, you know, blah, 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 and it fooled the judges. I mean, I don't think it was a very robust test, but, but still. So you could basically spend a lot of time and energy in optimizing the system for fooling judges and be successful in fooling, fooling the judges and, and yet not have any meaningful intelligence. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the Turing test is, is, is pretty useless. Apart from the fact I, you know, I, I mean, I, I hate the whole idea of with like Google Duplex, uh, you know, recently putting ums and ahs in there to basically make the conversation, um, you know, more natural and fool people into believing that it's, uh, it's a human. Uh, I, I don't like that. I don't think it's really very ethical to to build systems that fool people into believing that you're talking to a human when you're not. And in our call center applications, I think I, I always, um, you know, uh, always wanted the system to be quite clear that this is this is um, you know a very smart bot helping you, and uh, that's what it is. It's not a human you're talking to. And if you want to talk to a human, you can just ask for that. Mm -hmm. I should note just for the listeners um, that I did interview Aaron Sloman, who was one of the participants in the, uh, the that particular Turing test where you, Eugene Goosman supposedly passed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just if you want to check that out, you can look it up. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really interesting. Now, what about this idea of concept navigation? I think it's one of Pei Wang's sort of terms. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if he came up with that term, but um, he thinks that uh, part of understanding is is the ability to navigate through concepts, or maybe that's something that it relies on. 
Are you familiar with this? I, I haven't read <coughs> that sort of particular paper, but paper, but I'm, I'm, you know, fairly familiar with. Uh, Pei Wang's work and I, I, I like it a lot. Um, so yes, concepts are another term that I, I think are, are really, really, really important for AI, for AGI. And again, something that the sort of mathematicians and logicians tend to push aside, you know, because it's really a, a term you need to understand from epistemology. Um, so concept navigation, I, I to me, it's a bit of an indirect, uh, too indirect description of, of what understanding uh, means. However, it, it, yeah, it, it is certainly correct because concepts are abstractions and um, your understanding clearly needs to leverage abstraction. You need to be able to, to understand the bigger picture, you know, to grasp the bigger picture if you want to understand something. What are the implications of something? What is the more general idea behind the specific instance of the specific sentence that you are hearing? Uh, so, yes, understanding very definitely requires concepts and abstract concepts in particular. Mm -hmm. What about, um, have you uh, read much into markets? Well, you mentioned compression before. Right. Some people say that like uh, compression is a form of understanding or that that's the root of understanding. That's Mark and Cutter would have taken it. I, I think that's totally mistaken. I think that's just plain wrong. I don't think compression. Okay. And uh, I mean, then the first question is, are you talking about lossy compression or lossless compression? Uh, and because if you're talking, yeah, if you're talking about lossless compression, well, no, it, it, uh, it's just doesn't make any any sense that 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 would have anything to do with understanding uh, but but either way let me give you a very simple example here uh, that I actually thought of uh, just you know for our discussion thinking of thinking about I mean let's say you have a whole lot of pictures of uh, uh, traffic scenes uh, now you can compress a hell out of these pictures uh, but if what you're trying to understand is why do you know what is it that makes cars stop you know, so sort of like for no reason. I mean, if you came from a from the jungle or whatever, you know, from another planet, uh, you might say, "Well, the car's driving along perfectly well, and suddenly it just stops." Why is that? Now, compression, lossless or lossy, isn't going to solve that problem. That give you that understanding. It's basically particular features that you need to extract. In this case, it'll be that the traffic light turns red or you know, or somebody jumps in the, in, in, the, in, in the road with a sign stop, you know, halt or whatever it might be. But compression isn't going to give you that uh, by itself. Um, you need to know what features are, are actually important. And, and this comes back to the whole issue of concept formation and epistemology. And there's a, a really good book, uh, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. And what that explains is basically how you... Um, uh, how you have measurement emission as, as a key feature of, um, of concept formation. So you basically need to, you, you know, in any particular input, if it's visual or text or whatever, you have features, but let's look at visual. You have a lot of features that are out there. But the important thing is you need to know which are the features that you need to ignore and which are the features you need to pay attention to. And the ones you pay attention to will have a certain variability. So again, getting back to my example of a traffic light, the traffic light might have different shape, a different size, a different color, you know, looking at it from different angles maybe or different distances and so on. So you have that feature. Uh, and first of all, you need to kind of have some mechanism for fig figuring out there's actually the same feature that you're talking about. And then you have the variability of the feature. But nothing else in the image matters at all. All the other features are, are basically need to be discarded. Now, obviously, there are techniques for extracting those features. You know, reinforcement learning is, is, is one of them, a very expensive mechanism for, for doing it. And there, there are other mechanisms for doing it. But compression by itself, is, it just seems ludicrous to me that anybody should think that that uh, gives you intelligence or, um, uh, or understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there'll be a, um, a new term in the future called deep understanding. Is that already something? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I use it in my, I use <laughs> it in my, it? I actually use it okay. in my Maybe. pitch. Um, I use there it in we my, go. Yeah. Uh, 
Great minds think alike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, that's what you need. You need deep understanding, right? Exactly. Mm, mm, mm. Well, so we'll ho hopefully, that... nobody, nobody will destroy that term by putting it no. into um, marketing. Oh, right, you've heard it first here, everybody, if you haven't heard it from Peter Voss beforehand by reading his picture. <laughs> so, yeah. Don't destroy it. Don't destroy it. The last bastion of hope, understanding. All right. Okay. So, what about prediction? Um, like uh, Joshua Bach said that understanding is an acquisition of a model that allows you to integrate observed patterns into relationships and structures that make them predictable. Yeah, um, I, and so he gets all he's I, I, two things there. But, um, yeah, I love Josh, but <laughs> I love Josh and his work. But I think he's talking here like a mathematician, like a logician, uh, uh, which surprises me because he also has a lot of insights in cognitive psychology. Uh, but prediction by itself, again, I mean, from the examples we, we gave before, uh, isn't, isn't really the, the, the heart of it. Um, I mean, you need to be able to, for example, explain something in your own words. Now, that isn't prediction. You know, do you understand something? Can, can you use that information and, uh, in, in a different way? Do you, do you have you truly integrated? You know, it's not just a statistical thing that you yes you you can predict the thing and of course many things aren't predictable anyway you know so yeah trump got elected okay do i understand that does it mean i can predict what the outcome will be no it doesn't you know prediction again is just uh, it's a it's a red herring for for me as far as intelligence is concerned because a lot of things we can't predict yet we have deep understanding of the issues and we say well this might happen or that might happen or you know, uh, they're just, you know, we live in a chaotic world. We don't, we don't know. Um, so, yes, but, but does, you know, but in some cases, at least you have to say that an, understand, an, an understanding of something would constrain your, your view of its possible mm -hmm. future. Correct. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm not saying that uh, prediction isn't, uh, isn't related to understanding. You know, the better you understand something, the more likely you are to be able to, to pr predict it. Um, that, that is certainly true, but I think it's, it's kind of looking at the wrong, wrong aspect of it because, you know, then people will optimize for prediction and mm. then they're surprised why they don't get intelligent systems. Would you say that we understand things much better now that we have the scientific method? Or would, would you say that that particular methodology was not required for understanding? Uh, Oh, that's oh. a bit of a uh, sort of a weirdly <laughs> weird question. Yeah. Of course, we understood things before the the um, the uh, the scientific method, but I guess in terms of uh, thinking about ways to describe understanding, some of our archaic boutique versions of of, of description of understanding may have been completely off the planet, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, no, absolutely. The scientific method in, in, in general um, has given us a much deeper understanding of, of many, many issues. I mean, it's, it's basically a methodology for deepening your understanding, you know, the depth of, the depth of understanding that, that we have. So, yeah, I, I think uh, scientific, you know, rationality and scientific method, which are, you know, closely related. Um, have given us a much better understanding. I mean, we you know understand much better now what happens to the sun when it falls into the ocean, you know, and, and um, where where babies come from or whatever. You know? <laughs> so, um, a lot, a lot more we underst understand, and uh, yeah. Um. Well, there's a couple of things like uh, people, some people are suggesting, um, and I think it's interesting that uh, understanding could be useful for an AI to be able to um, make sense of our, of what we want. Like if we wanted to ask for, like we asked for, I, okay, please, I want you to paint the house. Um, and the, art, the artificial intelligence just thought, okay, paint house, and it covered the whole house in paint, including the roof and the windows and the inside and the floors and, and everything. Like, you know, everything in the house was covered in paint. Now, that's not what we wanted, but, but somebody with, you know, some understanding of what humans want and, and what may, painting the house might mean 
um, would only paint the outside of the house, like the boards and the outside. Right, of the house. right, right. Yeah. Of, of course, I mean, understanding and, and intelligence are, are completely related. Um, a system that doesn't have understanding and doesn't, you know, the depth of understanding that the system has uh, is directly related to how intelligent it is. And, you know, that's why I say, if you say to, to Siri, get me Uber and it gets you Uber and you, you think it understood you, well, yeah, it did the right thing. But if you say, I, I hate Uber and it gets you Uber, then, you know, you, you see that the, the understanding really wasn't, wasn't there. And, you know, you have the same thing with, uh, with, with humans. So, yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, what you, what you sort of, I think, alluding to here, what, what this directly relates to is this whole issue of the, uh, what, what they call the alignment problem in, you know, in, in scary AI or friendly AI, um, mm. where you know, there's this whole industry of people who think that there is an alignment problem, a serious alignment problem, totally ignoring mm. the, the, the issue of understanding. Because to the degree that an AI has understanding, you, you won't have an alignment problem or, you know, most of the alignment problem goes away. Uh, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to know that, no, you didn't really want the whole universe papered over with paper clips, you know, or converted to paper clips. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the example you gave, you know, you, you, you tell the AI to, to paint the house well. Yes, you would expect it to understand your motivation and, and what you're actually trying to do and what that what it what it actually even means to paint a house. I mean, even simple like that. Even knowing your motivation, your motivation may be to paint the whole house and the windows and everything. That may be your motivation because you're doing an art project or something, and then you might be really upset with the AI because it didn't paint over the windows. <laughs> Um, because it's but, uh, if, if somebody asked me to paint their house and they didn't tell me they were doing an art project and they didn't tell me that they wanted me to paint over the windows right, right. as well yeah and, and and once painting the house I, they, they came at me surprised and everything I'd, I'd be a little bit surprised at that, exactly a bit more specific right and, and that's yeah I mean that's where you I think the other topic you wanted to touch on is what's the relationship between understanding and common sense um, mm. you know, and then sort of obviously common sense is, is also related uh, to that. But common sense does not necessarily mean understanding because common sense is uh, like really knowledge that you have of things. And you may that people do that or they just, you know, they do that. I mean, they 10% of their salary goes to the church, you know, uh, in Germany. And even though they're not religious, so in, in Germany, that's common sense, you know, that basically you pay 10% of your salary to the church. And now, do you have an understanding of what's going on there? No, you, you just know it's common sense. So, you know, there, there are things that you kind of just know, well, that's just the way it is. So it's, it's common sense, but it's not, you don't necessarily understand why it is, uh, you know, that, that something, something happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should say that I went to Germany um, last year and, and visited both Dresden and Berlin. I did get to see some of the very opulent churches there. They're very beautiful, but 10% yeah. of everybody's wages. <laughs> <It's a lot. laughs> yes, you, you, when, when you, so, uh, I mean, I, I don't know what the percentage is, but probably 80 or 90% of, of Germans that aren't religious. And yet they still go through the ritual of baptism. And once you do that, you basically have to opt out of the church and, and there's some psychological thing that basically, you know, whether you're shunned by society or something, that mm. basically people tend not to opt out of the church. And then mm. basically automatically, uh, just your payroll automatically goes 10%, uh, I think it's 10%. Mm. It's, it's a chunk, a big chunk, automatically goes to the state and the state gives it to the church and perpetuates this whole evil in, um, institution. Mm. Hey, I'm just wondering, like, what your thoughts are. Do you think a, a um, an intelligence explosion is possible without machine understanding, without a machine being able to understand, let's say, itself, have an introspective understanding? No, um, no, no, it, no. It, it, it absolutely needs to uh, needs to have that level of understanding. You you can't have intelligence without understanding, ultimately, and certainly. To have self-improving um, intelligence without understanding, I mean, it's just absurd. You, you can't. Mm. It, has to, it has to be able to form concepts and have a conceptual awareness of itself. 
Uh, I mean, one simple example here is that um, it needs to be able to form a concept of what its scope of influence is in the world. So it needs to know what was I the agent of, you know, that, that happened in the world and what was caused by other people. Uh, you know, that has to be very robust. I mean, you, you, can't, uh, you can't effectively, um, you know, do science experiments or interact with people or, you know, in, in any way if, if you can't tell the difference between what you made happen in the world and what other people made happen in the world. And basically what, you know, what your capabilities are. You also need to have introspection in terms of um, are you confused, you know, or are you overwhelmed? Are you certain? So that, that kind of uh, level of conceptual understanding needs to, needs to be there in an AI uh, to be able to um, handle metacognition, basically, to, to manage its own cognitive processes. Mm, interesting. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, like... Um What's your definition? Okay, well, is, is understanding something that can be either on or off or by degree? I, I think you were saying like there is degrees of understanding, but you know, how do you, where does it start? What's the first principle of understanding then? Well, as I say, the, the, you, how do you get from zero to something? Yeah, understanding is not a mathematical term, you know, it's a practical term. So the, we, we use it to describe certain situations in the world. And so the, the first way we, we basically, the, the first, the most basic way we use understanding is whether somebody acts according to what they hear. But as we've discussed, that's a very shallow understanding. It can be wrong. I mean, you could be, you know, you, you, as I say, you could, you could say, I'm hungry and you, you pass somebody the bread and you say, okay, fine. Uh, obviously, the person understands me, but he didn't actually understand. He, he thought you said, pass me the bread, but you actually said, I'm hungry. You could have you know, passed him some fruit or something as well, and some cheese. So, uh, so the first use of the word of understanding is, does the person act accordingly, you know, according to what it is? Then the next sort of level, and uh, I actually... I guess I could look at my my article because I actually laid it out there in sort of a, yeah. a, a form. Um, but there is, can you explain what the person said in your own words? You know, that's that's kind of the next level of testing. And and in children, that's exactly what we do. You know, we we say, okay, did you understand what I said? Or foreigner, if you're trying to teach somebody a language, you know, say it back to me in your own words then you know the person has actually anti uh, integrated it. So the first one is basically a stimulus response. You know, you have some stimulus, blah, 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 Uber, trigger the Uber app. Okay, I hate Uber, trigger the Uber app. Okay, failure of understanding. So that's stimulus response. The, this, the, the sort of next level is that what you're hearing actually gets integrated with your existing knowledge, with your existing concepts, uh, which allows you to then explain it in your own terms by using abstractions or synonyms or, or whatever, you know, you, you, you know, understand it. Uh, another level of, of depth of, of understanding is that you have knowledge about the subject matter, uh, you know, and that you are able to understand more what the implications are of that because you have additional domain knowledge uh, uh, on, on the subject. So you have a, you know, you have a deeper understanding. And that, and that basically just continues to levels of implications and abstractions, uh, theory of mind, you know, do you understand somebody else? Uh, do you understand their motivation? Do you understand the implications? Do you know what that, what that implies, basically? So those are higher and higher levels or deeper and deeper levels of, of understanding. And there really isn't a way of saying, does the system understand or does it not understand, except in a very trivial way, like my, my Uber example, you know, don't call me Uber, it calls you Uber, then, okay, clearly it didn't understand what, what you meant. But, but that's a very basic test. Beyond that, it could perform the correct action, but still not have any, you know, depth of understanding about what you're saying. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. Um, I'm just, uh, it brought up an interesting thought. Uh, do, do you, is, is that a, like a, a, an alarm for you? Do you need to leave soon? No, I don't know. Okay, cool. No, just, All just right. Um, what, 
Does that now we as humans um, evolved all sorts of biases? Um, and we, we we're not unbounded um, rational agents, and so we have sort of uh, biases um, mm. or shortcuts to achieving things that would require greater computation if we didn't have them. Mm -hmm. So you know, AIs at this stage, if they're going to develop um, some forms of uh, understanding, do we need to sort of program them with biases or is that something that they will naturally um, come up with or evolve themselves in order to understand and situate things? Right. Uh, yes, I, I, I think you almost answered the question <laughs> yourself by the way you framed it is Sorry. that they, they will there will always be limited computational power, limited uh, time, and you know, Pei Wang has written uh, very clearly on that subject. You know that you that intelligence inherently has to work under limited knowledge and limited uh, computational power and and time, uh, which means absolutely you have to use certain uh, you know shortcuts, cognitive shortcuts, basically, uh, if you want to be able to operate. In the real world, and um, and and yes, obviously evolution has um, perfected some of these uh, these these things for survival and reproduction, um, or optimized them, I should say, for survival and reproduction, uh, but not necessarily for the best understanding or the most rational understanding. And in an AI, because we don't have to optimize for reproduction, one would hope. Um, or uh, survival, one would also hope, um, we can optimize for, uh, you know, sort of truth and insight and depth of understanding um, rather. But absolutely, there will, there will always be um, estimates and shortcuts and biases that are in, in the system that you, 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 you assume. I mean, induction is inherently creates biases, you know, as soon as you assume that the sun's going to set tomorrow then or tonight then uh, you know you, you have you have a bias an inductive bias there and which is supported of course by good reason you know <laughs> but then again, an, an asteroid could hit and um, you know we knocked out of orbit and the earth starts spinning the wrong way around or whatever you know and the sun, so it's set, it's set, it doesn't set anymore right the other. yeah that's true uh, it's interesting um that because yeah I, I just want to look at like um in in terms of understanding and what it could act in machines and what it could actually help humanity achieve mm -hmm. um i'm not sure that's always thought about like uh when, when we're talking about ai we often think of solving near, near term problems um, right. or solving uh you know uh, the sorts of problems that that are quite mundane that we might sort of uh, arrive at at work um but you know having a like a machine that understands could solve some, it sounds to me like it could be the tool to help solve a whole heap of really interesting things. Where do you think we're at in terms of understanding? What are some good examples of promising AI architectures today which you think exhibit understanding and how do you think they'll help solve humanity's largest problems? Well, um you know, we in the we are currently being swept up by the tsunami of deep learning, machine learning, big data. Mm -hmm. uh, DARPA calls it the second wave of AI. Uh, mm -hmm. first, day, first wave was good old fashioned AI. Second wave, mm -hmm. basically deep learning, machine learning, and for the last five six years, that's really just dominated the scene. Um, you know, if you want to do a PhD, it, it better be in deep learning, you know, otherwise you're not going to get a sponsor. If you want to earn the big bucks, it better be in deep learning, machine learning. Um, but then DARPA also talks about the third wave of AI, and that is really the real AI or AGI, a cognitive system that can actually learn interactively and reason and explain itself. And uh, now, who's working on the third wave? Um, almost nobody. Uh, I mean, we've been working on it for the last 20 years. So I'm really not aware of any project that is more advanced than ours. Uh, there are a couple of university projects uh, that have cognitive architectures that have some level of understanding, but deep learning machine learning systems inherently are not designed for any depth of understanding. They, 
can't explain themselves. Um, you know, they don't have reasoning. They don't have mechanisms for um, abstraction. Uh, so, I mean, they're really not, not cognitive in any, any sense of the word. So the, the whole current focus of, of AI that's sucking all the, all the oxygen out of there and, uh, is, is, is basically, a, you know, not geared up at all towards any depth of understanding. And, um, you know, I, I don't know how long it will take for, uh, for, you know, other people to, to really get some traction on cognitive architectures, which I believe are absolutely necessary for uh, understanding depth of understanding. Right. Understand right. Yeah, right. So what is it about cognitive architectures that sort of trump, um, sorry, sorry that, that word's been destroyed as well. That sort of, uh, <laughs> trump, that no, Trump, sort of, um, we'll, we'll, take it, we'll, we'll take it back. Oh, we'll take right. the word back. <laughs> Let's make Trump great again. <laughs> okay, um, so look, uh, if we can um, say what 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 does what is it about cognitive architectures then that um, that that, that uh, has that deep learning does not have, and and would you be able to create a hybrid in some way? Um, would that be useful? Um, well, I mean to answer your, your your second question first. Yes, in theory, the you know there's there, there probably some things from what's currently being done that could be used, but I, I haven't come across any meaningful proposals of, of hybrid systems. You know, I, I mean, a lot of people talk about it, you know, that yes, we need hybrid systems, but what I see right now is in the chat box, you basically have uh, a, a, a second wave categorizer, basically a deep learning categorizer that categorizes the intent of what somebody's saying, you know, blah, 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 Uber, blah, 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 umbrella, and gives you the weather report. Uh, and then they basically have first wave uh, primitive AI technology, or not even AI engineering technology, that has a flow chart and says, "Okay, now you now I'm in the Uber app, so I need to ask you where you want to go and how many people are going." And then somebody writes a program for for that. So that's sort of a, the hybrid approaches that that we're seeing, and that's really not very exciting, and certainly not going in the direction of of, of AGI. So yes, maybe hybrid approaches. Uh, um, clearly, there is, uh, you know, a lot of statistical information we accumulate as, as, as humans, uh, as we expose to the environment, that is also used as part of cognition. Um, but, um, it, it, you know, you, you asked me what, what are the advantages of a cognitive architecture. Uh, again, I have an article that goes into uh, some great lengths and, and uh, in that, in listing, I think they're like, 12 different features, um, key features that um, machine learning, deep learning isn't strong at. They either, it either can't do it at all or only in a very limited way. Um, so first of all is um, interactive learning, real-time learning, one-shot learning. Uh, you know, basically they don't do that typically. Uh, unsupervised learning, uh, you know, is, is, is another thing. They don't have deep understanding. They don't have generalization concept formation. Uh, they don't have reasoning ability. They're, they're a, a, a black box. Uh, I forget what the others are, but, you know, I mean, that's everything that, you, that you'd expect from an intelligent system uh, isn't there. <laughs> so basically, they don't have intelligence. I mean, that's, let me give you a very simple example here. Uh, if, if you wanted to judge, uh, you know, a human being intelligent, one of the simplest tests you might take is you might say to a five-year-old child, I might just say six words. I'll say, my sister's cat Spock is pregnant. <laughs> Very simple. Now, a five-year-old child will know immediately that I'm speaking, Peter is speaking, Peter has a sister, my sister owns a cat, the cat's name is Spock, so you might think it's male because of the name, and then you hear it's pregnant, so, you know, it's female. And you immediately integrate that and you have these facts available to you. And the next sentence might be, she's really big. So, you know, yes, the cat is pregnant, so it's big. And next week you might say, um, have the kittens arrived? And you would be able to make that connection. Now, deep learning, I mean, you know, if you say my, my sister's cat Spock is pregnant, uh, it, it might come back and give you a Star Trek episode. Hmm. Because it picks up in the word Spock, you know. I mean, there's, there's no learning, no understanding, no reasoning, you know, no memory. 
um, that's not intelligence. I mean, I'm sorry. That's just dumb. It's, you know, it's software engineering. Well, um, what, what sorts of, um, okay. So when do you, how, how, um, how long do you think it'll take for people to start moving on to the third wave as, as DARPA described it of AI, that it is true AI, AI of understanding. How long do you think um, it'll take for um, you know a large amount of the industry to sort of start moving in that direction? And, uh, uh, when, when do you think people, when, will it be when um, deep learning hits a wall if it already hasn't? Um, yeah. And, uh, so, I, I mean, Obviously, I'm so deeply steeped in cognitive architectures and what we're doing and the frustration of seeing that, you know, everybody's sort of going down this dead end, you know, and, and the, the, the hundreds of billions of dollars that are basically poured into that just to improve the click rate for Google so that they can get more advertising revenue or to, you know, uh, for Amazon to better target uh, stuff they can sell you and and so on. So it's 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 quite frustrating from you know from from my perspective, and I don't know how long it will take. I mean, obviously, a lot of people are making a lot of money from deep learning, machine learning, and uh, you have a whole generation of computer scientists that actually don't know anything else. And more, when I go to AI conferences or talk about AI. Uh, it's very, very common for people to simply equate AI with deep learning. They don't even know that there was ever anything other than deep learning and AI. That's really where we are. So I think there may be a whole sort of lost generation <laughs> that doesn't even know what the term AI stands for, that the original dream and the original mission of AI was always to build thinking, learning machines, you know, machines that can learn and think and reason the way humans do. So... I don't know, we, we may, it, it, it could take potentially decades uh, for, for this to turn around. I, it's, it's really hard to predict. Now, on the other hand, with what we're doing, um, I believe that we will, uh, what our technology is, can be a real wake-up call. But, you know, we need to get out there in the world and show what a difference it makes when you have a machine that has understanding or a deeper level of understanding that can reason, that can learn interactively, um, that doesn't need masses of tagged data, you know, can learn in an unsupervised way, um, that people suddenly wake up and say, whoa, wait, you know, how do, we, how do we get our deep learning systems to do that? And they'll discover that, well, you really can't. And, um, you know, and then... But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, yeah. I mean, it could happen. You know, it could happen. It, it, it could happen next year, basically, or yeah. it could be ten years or more before um, people really is wake it, up. Is, yeah. Is, is there a market force to sort of solve problems that, that understanding um, can solve that current humans can't solve? Um, like, you know, I mean, like for instance. You're talking about uh, um, like automating uh, it's, uh, some sort of call center software earlier. Um, is, is, is it a case that we can solve, like that will require, the market will demand and require for machine understanding to, to solve problems that, you know, um, limited forms of deep learning and, and good old fashioned AI just can't? Or will it just continue to rely on humans? No, absolutely. I mean, there are masses and masses of, of, of problems. I mean, really anywhere where you have a natural language conversational interface, uh, you need a cognitive architecture. And, and here I'm focusing on language because that's what we're working on. I mean, the same ultimately is true for perception and action as well. Um, you know, in terms of robots being able to learn. If you want a robot in the house that that, you know, can really understand what it's supposed to do and understand the implications and get common sense. You also straight into cognitive architectures. You can't train it with the huge long tail that you have of situations that a home robot will come across, you know, a mobile home robot, uh, Rosie the robot. It's impossible to do that with deep learning. It is literally impossible to do it with deep learning by itself because you can't train it with all the examples that it will come across. Uh, come across, you know, you can't, it's, and it needs to be able to adapt 
uh, dynamically, you know. So, you know, you get a new pet in the house or you get, anyway, I mean, any number of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on that natural language. And yes, absolutely. Any application where you want meaningful conversation or deep understanding of text, you can't do it with, with, with deep learning. And we have many applications. I mean, one of them, um, we did a, a, a trial for a big law company that um, used IBM Watson, and I'm happy to actually name names here, uh, to, to try and read their legal contracts so that the employees could then ask the AI um, you know, are we allowed to use interns on this, you know, or can we charge for business travel? Because each contract with their clients has different terms and conditions, and some of these contracts are 100 pages, you know. And uh, it failed completely, miserably, uh, to, to, to do that, because statistically reading a document and just sort of getting statistical averages is, is useless. You know, you need to understand every word in, in, in the contract and you need to have the common sense knowledge. You need to have deep understanding of the domain. What does it mean, for example, if you say um, the client considers photocopying overhead? Will the client pay for it or want to pay for it? Well, if you consider it overhead, it means, it implies uh, your understanding of the term of that something is considered an overhead implies that they will not pay for it. So, you know, there's, um, that's one example. We, we have also very strong interest from robotics companies. Um, if you have a robot in a hospital or in a hotel, you want to be able to talk to it. You know, say, go to the dispensary and pick up this order and deliver it there. And you want the system to be able to understand you uh, and, you know, um, give exceptions or ask you for clarification. You know, should I stop off here or how urgent is this? And the same in a hotel, you know, delivering things. Um, we have very strong interest from companies um, that have complex software, uh, ERP software or business intelligence software. That software is becoming so complex that basically people aren't getting the most out of the software because it's too difficult to actually remember all the options you have and go down drop-down menus and other menus, fill out a form before the system can give you the results you want. So all of these big software companies want a natural language interface that you can actually talk to and say, give me my sales for the last three months by product for Europe. And the system can execute that then, but it needs to have a deep enough understanding that you can, if the next sentence is exclude Britain because they're gonna Brexit, then it can make sense of that and adjust the thing and show it to you without uh, Britain. Or that you can say to the system, run that cash flow report you did for me last week and it has memory and remembers that, and it might come back and say, uh, do you mean the one for Argentina or the one for Brazil? You know, that it can disambiguate. Uh, statistical systems don't have a hope in hell of, of, of uh, doing those levels of uh, interactions because they don't learn interactively. You know, they don't have memory. They can't reason. They can't explain themselves. So yeah, massive, massive applications are, are out there waiting for cognitive architectures. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay, well, um, I, I realise that it's getting uh, a bit like we're probably heading a little bit over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just, uh, have you got anything that you wanted to talk about which we haven't covered yet? Um, uh, any, any interesting points here? No, I think I'd just like to sort of uh, re-emphasise the point I think that I started with is that um, I, I think the biggest problem that I see in, in, the, in the field of AI is that you don't have enough cognitive psychologists. You don't have enough people with a deep understanding of epistemology as well, you know, philosophy. I think you really need to understand, you need to understand intelligence, what intelligence is, uh, what knowledge is, uh, what concepts are. Uh, you need to understand that from a cognitive point of view if you want to build AI systems, you know, that, that have real intelligence. And, uh, you know, that's really not where the focus is right now. Mm -hmm. True. Well, it's been wonderful speaking to you again, Peter, and I hope to do it again sometime in the next few years or something. Uh, maybe I'll come to America and I uh, oh, attend right. a conference and I'll see you there, <laughs> but who yeah, knows? Yeah, well, if, you, if you're in LA, stop by and um, mm -hmm. yeah, this was, this was fun. As you see, I'm still as passionate about intelligence and the topic as I was six years ago, so yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I want to make it happen. Mm, absolutely, it's do I. So thanks, Peter. Um, yeah. Right.
And if there are any links, uh, uh, like, um, yeah, please send them to me and I'll put them in the description of the video. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, you can just find me, Peter Boss, on Medium. Uh, I have a lot of articles mm. there, but I will actually send oh, yeah. you the link. I'll right see you in there. Um, mm. Okay. Well, thanks. It was fun. Thank you. Uh, Cheers. Okay, bye. All right. Yeah, that's a that's a link there to um, to m most of my articles. Oh yes, fantastic. Um, so you've just stopped recording, then, haven't you? Oh no, you're still recording. That's you're, okay. You're, um, you're recording. Remember? Oh, my recording. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, it is recording. Right. So, so. Um, oh, I thought that. <laughs> Somehow I just thought that you were doing the recording then. Uh, yeah, I don't know how this Zoom software works yet. <laughs> okay. Never mind. All right, thanks heaps, man. And uh, yeah, we'll um, yeah, speak again soon. Okay, Have a all good right. One. Okay, bye. Bye.